I was going to look at um, the synopsis of uh, 1888 message, but then uh, uh, along the day, I had to change to something. And how I pray that um, it will resonate with the times that you are living in, and uh, we shall be benefited by uh, this uh, presentation, that uh, we shall be benefited uh, by this presentation. Uh, I've titled uh, our presentation, I've titled our presentation, Our Present Duty, Our Present Duty. And uh, for such a time as this, there can be no any other duty that the Lord calls us to attend to than the duty of uh, seeking his face and uh, praying without ceasing, seeing that the times that we are living in are perilous times. And I'd like to share something on the day, day of atonement, just sharing something on the day of atonement, and I hope it will uh, bless our souls. In the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 14, is where I like to consider. But uh, I'll start as early as uh, Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 downwards to verses um, 14. In Daniel chapter 8, verses 9, verses 9, we read down, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And uh, it waxed great even to the host of heaven. Uh, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon uh, them. But what I'm considering is verses 11 to verses 14, not in details, but uh, just basic things to help us move along. Here he magnified himself even to the prince of host, the little horn. And we understand from Daniel 7 that uh, the little horn is uh, the fourth kingdom, which is uh, actually the Roman Empire, both in it is pagan and uh, papal state uh, faces. The curious thing here is that uh, it magnified him itself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. This magnifying itself is what we have to consider a lot. Verse 12 and asked, a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth. Another thing that you notice, apart from magnifying itself to the prince of the host, uh, you should notice that it cast down the truth to the ground. So that magnifying itself, the little horn of the Roman uh, uh, power, that is uh, the pagan state and the papal state, it, in, it is magnifying itself, it cast down the truth to the ground. And verse 13, while Daniel was seeing these things, he wondered something. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? For how long shall this sanctuary truth be lost to the people of God. And uh, the wonderful number in this speech, in verse 13, he answered that, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we have the magnifying to the prince of the host, the truth being cast down, but then the sanctuary being cleansed. I wouldn't go into the dates and all that stuff. I just want to look at this uh, 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 the, the qualitative aspect of Daniel chapter 8, uh, the magnifying uh, of the little horn to the prince of the host, the casting down of the truth, and then uh, the sanctuary being cleansed. That, that, that is my uh, labor this uh, hour. And so, unto 2,300 days, <laughs> no. then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And uh, uh, we know that um, the sanctuary was cleansed in Leviticus chapter 23 on the day of atonement. 
and then in Leviticus chapter 16, and there were things which were done in the cleansing of the sanctuary in the yearly services. We had what we call the daily services, where actually the sinner could come with the sacrifices uh, when they had sinned, uh, or the lamb of sacrificial lamb, and then confess their sins, give, be given uh, a knife according to Leviticus chapter 4, and then uh, kill the sacrificial lamb. Then they drain the blood, give to the high priest, and then he will go to sprinkle on the veil uh, uh, for the daily uh, uh, atonement. But when it came to the yearly services, actually they were appointed the two goats, the goat of the Lord and um, the Azazel, where actually the, the goat of the Lord, the blood was brought in into the, uh, uh, the, the sanctuary, and then the Azazel, it was sent into the wilderness. But there were things which were needed to be done on this day of atonement on the cleansing of the sanctuary in the yearly services. In the book of uh, Leviticus, chapter 23, there are things that uh, we notice. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 27, it says that... Um, also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary on that day. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your soul and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among the people. You shall do, you shall do no man of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even unto even you shall celebrate. Your Sabbath. And so we see our duty on this day mostly was to afflict our souls. And that is why I have um, really titled the presentation, Our Present Duty. And what is this present duty that uh, we are having? Um, I, I want us to travel through this um, as the Lord will lead us. Uh, our present duty and why we are Seventh-day Adventists. We are told we are Seventh-day Adventists. Are we ashamed of our name? We answer, no, no, we are not. It is the name that the Lord has given us. It points out the truth that is to be the taste of churches. That is, that this may be, we must look ever to Jesus. In uh, Faith I Live by page 304, paragraph 4. The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will convict the inquiring mind. Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressor of God's law and it will lead to repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many who are looking to you to see what religion can do for you. If you are faithful in your God-given work, you will write, you will make right impression and will lead souls in the way of righteousness. So if um, we are faithful in our God-given work, we will make right impressions. And we cannot be faithful to the work that we have been given if we do not know the work itself that we have been given. Now, why are we called the Seventh-day Adventists? Um, you find that um, the Lord created the heavens and the earth for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested, sanctified it, so that um, man, after doing his own work, he may remember that uh, the Lord is his creator and share in that sanctification. The Lord finished his work in six days and rested. And it is not like the Lord rested because he was tired, but um, um, he was satisfied with what he had been doing and then rested, not that he was tired. And so also for us, we are to examine every Sabbath when we have worked for the six days, we have to examine ourselves that have we been able to do the works that um, we are supposed to do and accomplish them. And now we can share in the rest of the Lord. Many people are opposed to this issue of working. But um, there is no keeping aright the Sabbath 
when you have not worked for the six days. For the commandment itself says that remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou, sh thou shalt work. So enjoined in the keeping of the Sabbath is the laboring for six days. You will never find rest until you have labored rightly what the Lord has given you, the portion to labor on. And sin, sin broke on this face of the earth. Our main work has been to remedy every defect in our character. And every time we attend the Sabbath, we uh, signify the, uh, 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 the final rest that we shall have in Jesus Christ after we have lived the period that has been allotted to us in this face of the earth. So God has given us the week to examine ourselves if we come into the Sabbath, if we, have, if we will have accomplished that we are, which we are supposed to accomplish in that week. So the period given unto us on this face of no, the earth sorry. Oh, this is uh, we have to accomplish the work that we have been given so as to enter into the rest of the Lord. And if we are not accomplishing that, which is to remedy every defect in our character, then it will be uh, not easy to enter into the Sabbath of the Lord fully or to enter into the kingdom of God fully because there will be a portion which is remaining. Think about this when you are approaching the Sabbath. And the work that you must do during the week has not been accomplished. Your mind is not settled in that Sabbath. And uh, to some extent, you can be distracted from it. It is by accomplishing the work that you have been given to do during the week that you can uh, uh, calmly enter into the Sabbath rest of uh, the Lord during the week. And so the period that man has been given uh, to live on this face of the earth, if he doesn't accomplish what he has been told to accomplish, then he won't be fit to enter into the Sabbath of the Lord when Christ comes the second time to take his children uh, home. And so we must understand our work, which is the work of afflicting our souls, and make sure that um, by the grace that the Lord has given unto us, we are aiming to accomplish the work that has been given unto us after sin entered into the world. We shall not lower the standards. The name Seventh Day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Here is the line of distinction between the worshippers of God and those who worship the beast and receive the mark. The great conflict is between the commandments of God and the requirements of the beast. It is because the saints are keeping all the Ten Commandments that the dragon makes war upon them. If they will lower the standard they deal to the peculiarities of their faith, the dragon will be at peace, but they excite his ire because they had dare to raise the standard and unfurl the banner in opposition to the protestant world who are worshiping the institution of the purpose and uh, you see we cannot be a standing rebuke to the world when we are daily lowering the standards when we are not working with the lord uh whatsoever the lamb goeth in the sanctuary because the whole theme of the sanctuary is for the people who are being redeemed to follow the Lamb whatsoever he goeth. And in John 1, 29, we are told, uh, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so if we are following him in every apartment that he's in, then what essentially we are doing is uh, giving him our sins in every step so that he may cleanse us and be able to give us his own righteousness. That is why, uh, 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 we are called uh, on the face of the earth at such a time as this to fulfill that duty of giving the lamb our sins that they may be forgiven, that the Lord may have a pure church which can be an example to the world which the little horn has deceived and trampled the truth down. That there are a people who have not been deceived, but they are still following their high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Without doing that, there is no difference between Sabbath keepers and the other Protestant world who doesn't follow Christ through the sanctuary, whatsoever place that he goeth. Again, we are told, dear brethren and sisters, do we believe in all our heart that Christ is soon coming and that we are now having the last message of mass that is ever be? To be given to the guilty world is our example what it should be 
Do we, by our lives and holy conversation, show to those around us that we are looking for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall change these vile bodies and fashion them like unto the glorious body? I fear that we do not believe and realize these things as we should. There is too much seeking after amusement and things to take the attention in this world, and things to take the attention in this world. The mind is left to run too much upon brace and the tongue is engaged too often in light, in light and trifling conversation, which gives the light to our profession, for our conversation is not in heaven when, when we look for our Savior. I'll writing 111, page 1. And so this is a lamentation that um, while the world is caught up in amusement and their tongues are not uh, are projected and to the heavenly places, but they are participating in the things of the world, uh, 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 we are not uh, showing the world our peculiarity. When, if what we are seeking is what the world is seeking at the same time, then we do not show the peculiarities of our, of our, our features to the world. For in the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the children of Israel, they had to be gathered around the sanctuary and they had to afflict their souls their prayers were to be ascending high to heaven and their eyes were to be directed unto the most holy place to see if the sacrifice of the high priest was accepted. But how could the sacrifice of the high priest be accepted when the sins of individuals had not gone beforehand and confessed so as to be forgiven? It was not a matter of a, a, a play, but it was a serious time that they were in that everyone had to search their souls and see if there was something impeding that was to be given to the high priest or to be passed to the high priest so that uh, the atoning blood may be able to cleanse the people who were gathered around the sanctuary. Again, the Lord, the way of the Lord is in the sanctuary, Psalm 77, verse 13. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary, who is as great God as our God. And so if uh, our heavenly Father's way is in the sanctuary, then our ways must not be found in any other place, but our ways must be directed in the sanctuary. Now, when you look at the word way, it is, it, uh, it is the same as path or a pathway or a walk. So our walk is in the sanctuary. Now, how does God or how does the Lord walk in his sanctuary? Uh, when you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, how does the Lord appear in his pathway or in his sanctuary? Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twine he covered his face, and with twine his feet, and with twine he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And so when, when you look at our God and our Lord in his sanctuary, his pathway is filled with his glory. And so those who follow him, their pathway may be filled with the glory. In our, the book of Matthew, we are told that um, let your light show, so shine so that men may give glory to your heavenly Father. And uh, in the book of Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter three, chapter three, verse eighteen, we are told. But we all with open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even us by the spirit of the Lord. So the little horn in Daniel chapter seven and chapter eight wants to obliterate the sanctuary truth, which is a revelation of God's glory. And that glory is nothing else but the impartation of that righteousness and the character that is able to make us be where he is. Because if we are near him and still entertaining sin, then that glory will consume us, according to Isaiah 59, that your sins have separated you with your God. And so the more we behold him, the more we follow him in the sanctuary, 
in this day of cleansing the sanctuary, the more we are turned into the same image by the rules of adaptation. The more we spend with him, the more we are adapted to his image, the more his glory is revealed unto us. Not just the covering owned by his glory, but the revelation of his character and how his standards are high and only we can attain it in him, not in ourselves, but in him. For he is the one who wills uh, to do of his own pleasure in us. And so the Lord's way is in the sanctuary and those who go into the sanctuary, they will just be like him. But why is this theme of the sanctuary so important? The cleansing of it and the following of the lamb whatsoever he goes. In uh, Evangelism page 222, and uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 520, we read, we are in the great day of atonement or we are in the great day of the cleansing of the temple, according to Daniel 8, 14. And the sacred work of Christ for the people of God that is going on at the present time is the heavenly sanctuary should be our constant study. The work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary should be our constant study. The, let us pause that there are um, many things which people are studying. And it is not bad that there are many things which people are studying. It's good to study. But then we are told that the study of the sanctuary and it is cleansing should be our constant study. Why? Because there are many truths contained in the word of God, but what the flock needs at such a time as this is the present truth. What is the present truth? exactly what Christ is trying to do or is doing in the heavenly sanctuary and how it pertains to uh, our eternal well-being. And so that should be our constant study. What is God doing? What is Christ doing in the heavenly sanctuary? And how does it relate to our salvation in present time? And so instead of studying many things which may not help us at such a time as this, we are told that our constant study should be the theme of um, the atonement or the cleansing of the sanctuary. As a people, we should be honest student of prophecy. We should not rest until we become intelligent in regard to the subject of the sanctuary. And so, uh, you know how people get elated in uh, studying numbers and uh, dates and all this stuff. And it, it's not bad to study these things. But then we are told that the prophecies in line with the cleansing of the sanctuary should be studied so that the people may know what we read in the next uh, 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 slide, um, the reason why we should study these things. But such a subject as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to one, explain the past Advent movement, number two, and to show what our present position is, and number three, to establish the faith of the doubting. And number four, give certainty to the glorious future. This I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. And so when we study the cleansing of the sanctuary in connection with the prophetic date 2300 days, the very things that we come to understand is our past Advent movement. How has the Lord led his people in the past? And then after knowing how the Lord has led his people in the past, we can know how he is leading us at the present time and see if we are in line with that leading or if we are offline. And number three, if we study these things, then it will establish the faith of the doubting. Sometimes we are um, full of doubts and our faith is tried so much, but if we will want our faith to be established and not be in doubt, then the sanctuary in connection with 2300 days should be studied. And then number four, it will give us a certainty to the glorious future. Just as a farmer goes into the farm, knowing that this is the time of planting, this is the time of weeding, and this is the time of harvesting, and this is the time of preservation. In studying the sanctuary and the cleansing of the sanctuary, it helps us to know the times and that which is ought to be done at that uh, time. Uh, so prophecy 
And the cleansing of the sanctuary and prophecy is like a compass. It is like our lighthouse, which when we follow, we shall not be lost. Because in it, uh, as we study it, we shall draw more closer to God because we are not drawing far away from the Lord. But as we study these subjects, we draw nigh to God and he continues cleansing us from our defilement and from our iniquities and unrighteousness. Importance of studying the sanctuary. This subject sheds, sheds great light on our present position and work and gives us unmistakable proof that God has led us in our past experience. Evangelism, page 222, paragraph 3. Again, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designed them to fill. And this is to me very important because uh, when we talk about everyone having a knowledge for themselves, Christ says in the book of Matthew 24 that many false Christ and many false teachers shall arise, leading men astray from the path because narrow is the way and few find it and broad is the way and many be in it. And so the safest way to be on the right road is to study for yourself. And the Lord has promised every child of his that he will give the Holy Spirit, so that they may be able to understand the things that they are reading. Not negating the point that uh, people have been given different gifts in the church to help the church come to the full stature and the measure of the man Jesus Christ according to Ephesians chapter 4. We have been endowed with different gifts, but the Lord doesn't call us to depend on the gift. The Lord calls us to depend on him. Because some may prepare, tend to have the gift and at the end of the time, interpret the things to suit their taste. But if we rely on the Lord, then he shall be able to give us the right interpretation. And then he will uh, 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 give us um, the knowledge of the position we ought to occupy at such a time as this. The reason why the message is not going forth as it should be, it is because of this issue of not people occupying the position they should be occupying. Many people in Christendom are not occupying the position they should be occupying on this uh, day of atonement. But we need a knowledge for ourselves and of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible to exercise the faith that is needed at such a time as this. There is a time for everything. There is a faith which was practiced in the courtyard. There is a faith which was practiced in the holy place. And there is a faith that has to be practiced in the most holy place. And so knowing our position and our work will help us to occupy the right position. We are not in the courtyard where there are some things which were allowed during the daily services. We are not in the holy place where some other things also were allowed or not allowed. We are in the most holy place in the very presence of God where we have to understand what is allowed in this place and what is not allowed in this place. Take an example of our daily life. When you go to the garden, we know what is needed in the garden. When you go to a palace or in the office of the president, you know what is needed there. You know what to do for that place that you are at a certain time. And so understanding the times that we are living in, the place of our high priest and his position and his work will help us to know I'm not just in a common place. I'm not just in an ordinary place, but in, I'm in a very solemn place. And in this solemn place, there are things which are needed and there are things which are not needed. Now, this is not to be done by our own power because uh, in the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, Philippians 1 chapter 6, because as we speak these things, people get worried that uh, we dwell so much on what the Lord wants us to do, but not what the Lord is doing for us. But I want just to reassure us, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
it is not you who started to go into the sanctuary. Repentance and coming to the Lord is a gift by him. The lost sheep will not return home unless the shepherd went to seek for it. When we were lost, and I want us to go back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, they did not look for the Lord. They went hiding. They put on their own garments to hide them from their nakedness and to hide from the Lord. So they didn't seek the Lord. Uh, even the book of Job says that Adam, see, uh, Adam hid his iniquity. And the Lord came seeking for him. The same way the Lord went seeking for Adam is the same way he has sought for us. And so he has taken us right away from the wilderness that we were in, brought us in his camp, made us enter into the courtyard and travel with him in the holy place. And he is making us travel with him in the holy place. And so the work is not left on us to do, but the work is of Christ. And what we have to do is surrender so that he may lead us along. He has his hand outstretched that he may lead us where he wants us to go. Our work is to respond to that still voice and be able to travel with him whatsoever he leadeth us. Again, we are told that um, all need to become intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. The solemn scene of the judgment, the great day of atonement should be kept before the people and urged upon their conscience with earnestness and with power. And so instead of dwelling a lot of time in the things which will not bring the mind to perfection, we should dwell on those things, which is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, what made the sanctuary unclean? Because the sanctuary itself was pure. It is the confession of the sin to the high priest who took the blood of confession to the sanctuary, to the veil, and sprinkled upon it that, that made the sanctuary unclean. So it is our sin that made the sanctuary unclean. And it will be by accepting his righteousness that our sins will not continue going to the heavenly sanctuary, and then there will be no more defilement of the sanctuary. So when the people of God receive the righteousness of Christ, there is no more confession of sins and the cutting of the blood to the veil and the sprinkling of this blood. They have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and then he can come to claim them as his own. So it is my sin, it is your sin that has made the sanctuary uh, unclean. And for the sanctuary to stop being defiled and being unclean, then it means that our people have to accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ and then stop uh, sinning. This should be our constant study and uh, seeking to make the path of others right in this journey that we are in. Again, what is the importance of studying this sanctuary theme and the cleansing? Because in the future, deception of every kind is to arise and we want so solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. The enemy will bring in false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points in which there will be a departing, uh, a departing from the faith. Now, you won't hear people saying that there is no sanctuary most of the time. Yes, it has been prophesied that this will be one of the things that will be done in the last days. But the time that we are living in, you don't hear so much people saying there is no sanctuary. What you hear people saying is that... Uh, you know what? You can't overcome sin. And you ask the person, what, what, what are you trying to say when you say you can't overcome sin? Essentially, they are saying there is no sanctuary because the work of the sanctuary is to cleanse all the sins from the sanctuary so that people may have a holy people dwelling in that sanctuary. And so whenever you hear somebody saying that you cannot not overcome sin, that is just a subtle way of saying there is no sanctuary because without overcoming sin, then there is no that sanctuary. And so deceptions of every kind shall arise in this end time. And one of them will be uh, the doctrine that there is no sanctuary or uh, there is no victory over sin. So at any time during the year when a sinner presented his offering and confessed over 
eat his sins, an atonement was made for him. He was forgiven. His sin was symbolically transferred to the sanctuary by the ministration of the blood of the offering and the burning of his altar portions, in some cases by the priest, eating a portion of it. Nevertheless, full atonement for his sin had not been made. Though his sin was forgiven, he must continue in the way of obedience. Should he fail to do so and neglect to afflict his soul upon the day of atonement, all of his uh, uh, as well forgiven sins will return upon him and he must die. His only safety lay in enduring to the end. Then and only then could he expect to be saved. That um, we cannot be saved in disobedience. When you look at the book of uh, Ephesians, also we are told that um, that he may have a church which is without spot and wrinkle. I think it is Ephesians or Colossians, one of the books in chapter five, that he may present his bride without any spot or any wrinkle. And uh, just to highlight also something important here in uh, faith and works page um, 100, uh, faith and works page 100, we are told, but while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. And you, you know that our presentation is our present duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And you may ask, where is that in the Bible, continued obedience and taking heed to that which we have? In the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, sorry, continual obedience, we are told, therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. So the very things we have received, the very teachings and the very righteousness of Christ that we have received, we should give more honest heed. And Giving more honest heed is not just listening carefully to what somebody is saying, but being able to continue in those things or to uh, uh, execute those things that you have heard being spoken to you. But if we do not take honest heed to these things that we have heard, we are told they'll slip from us. But if they slip from us, notice what happens in verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had it? So in taking honest heed, there is the continuing steadfastly in those things we have heard lest we be in transgression and disobedience and receive a just recompense, which is actually the punishment and losing so great a salvation, which at first was first began to be spoken by our Lord. So not taking honest heed to the things that um, we have received and we have heard, we lose so great salvation. That is the most important point that uh, we should understand. On the day of atonement, on the day of atonement, the day of final and complete atonement, that day of cleansing the sanctuary, um, it was uh, for all sin confessed and forgiven during the year. The blood of the Lord's God symbolically removed these sins from the sanctuary, making atonement for it also. It too was now free from sin. So that atonement re 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 removes the sin from the sanctuary, and the sanctuary remains free from sin. Now, let us not forget we are that sanctuary. We are that temple that is being cleansed, for the sanctuary is made unclean by our conduct, by our way that we live. So on the first day of the seventh month came the blowing of crumpets, which was to call the attention of the people the day of atonement. Ten days later, 
The intervening nine days became days of heart searching, of preparation for the day of atonement, the day of judgment that sealed their destiny. So another point we notice that we are in the period where our destiny is being sealed. Now, brothers and sisters, think about this. If we cannot overcome sin, if the sanctuary is not being cleansed from the sin, why is Christ taking so much long to come if there is no victor over sin? There is no receiving of Christ's righteousness in fully. Why is he tarrying for this long? It wouldn't make sense that Christ will take long to come if there is no cleansing of the sanctuary or the cleansing of the soul temple from every defilement. He should just come and take these sinful people wherever he is because there is nothing so much important going on in the heavenly sanctuary or in that apartment. But we understand that the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary is according to Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as even your father in heaven is perfect. Now, you don't raise the question, how perfect? Just as the Bible says, be perfect, so you be, be perfect. How perfect? It is the heavenly father who knows, but he requires that you be perfect. And as you draw to him, you will continue um, really reflecting his image and I'll continue reflecting his image. This Christian walk due to congregation on the day of atonement, maybe as some, um, we try to uh, bring this to a uh, close. The Old Testament is the ground where the seeds of practical goodness were first sown. This was repeated in Christ's words to his disciples. Uh, we have yet to learn that we have yet to learn that the whole Jewish economy is a compacted prophecy of uh, the gospel. I, I want us to think about that, that uh, the whole Jewish economy is a compacted prophecy of the gospel. Now, what we have to ask ourselves, what is the gospel? If the sanctuary theme is a compacted prophecy of the gospel, we ask the Lord, what is the gospel? And um, I believe that uh, the Bible can answer us what is the gospel? According to Acts, what is the gospel? Romans chapter 1. In verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So what is this gospel that he is separated unto? He says, So much as in me is, Verse 15, Romans 1, 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So we can say the sanctuary, which is a compacted prophecy, is the power of salvation. And what is that salvation? When man was created, he was in the likeness and in the image of his creator. Sin came in and marred the image of God. And the work of the sanctuary is, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to the pattern which I have showed you. And I shall come and commune with thee. Now, that word commune is so much important because in Genesis chapter 3, when they sinned, they ran away from him and they were separated from him. The work of the sanctuary is to bring these people in the very presence of God so that he may commune with them again. Not only in symbols, but also in reality. So what has been a compacted prophecy in symbols and in shadows? has to reach its reality in the proclamation of the gospel when these shadows and symbols are fulfilled in the lifestyle of that person who is walking through this um, uh, sanctuary, the person who is walking through uh, this sanctuary. So the sanctuary is a compacted prophecy of the gospel. And we again are told that... Um, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every living soul upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue 
of the contest between righteousness and sin. So when we are going through the sanctuary, we are going through the great conflict and the great context between righteousness and sin. The work of the Lord is that he may eradicate sin. The work of the little horn is that he may obliterate, put an eclipse, put a shadow on the sanctuary truth, which is righteousness and overcoming sin, to people continuing to sin, people continuing not to understand the cleansing of the sanctuary, so that when the high priest leaves the heavenly sanctuary, the people may not be ready for his coming. It opens to view a complete system of truth connected and harmonious, perfectly calculated to explain the past, the present, and establish faith in certain glorious future. Now, we cannot talk about uh, the glorious future if we are still entertaining sin, if we are still entertaining sin. And so, in Selected Message, Book 1, page 125, paragraph 2, what is our condition in this fearful and solemn time? Alas, what pride is prevailing in the church, what hypocrisy, what deception, what love of grace, frivolity and amusement, what desire for the supremacy. All these sins have clouded the mind so that eternal things have not been designed. Shall we not, one, search the scriptures that we may know where we are in this world history? Two, shall we not become intelligent in regard to the work that is being accomplished for us unto this time? And three, the position that we as sinners should occupy while the work of atonement is going forward. If we have any regard for our soul's salvation, we must make a decided change. We must seek the Lord with true repentance. We must, deep, we must with deep conviction of our soul, confess our sins that, we may be, that they may be blotted out. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. When looking at the cleansing of the sanctuary and rebuilding of this house to be a habitation of the Lord, this is what Peter tells us, and this is our duty at such a time as this. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Remember this word, all guile. The 144 have no guile in their mouth, according to Revelation chapter 14. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereof. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones, the sanctuary was built by those stones, are uh, built up a spiritual house. So we human beings are lively stones building that spiritual house, the rebuilding of the sanctuary and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. When the high priest entered into the sanctuary to offer sacrifices, he had to be holy. And as a people who have been ordained to be a holy priesthood, we cannot offer sacrifices while we are practicing non-sin. We must be cleansed so as we may offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto the Lord. And so this is the very work that the Lord is seeking to do in us, that uh, we may regard, if we have any regard for our soul salvation, we must make a decided change. We must understand with that we are that spiritual stones to rebuild the temple. In fact, the Jewish were told to rebuild the temple. And in that rebuilding, the temple was... Um, a prolepsis of what is called the cleansing of the temple or rebuilding the temple of the Lord, the soul temple from every defilement. Now, in Great Controversy 488, paragraph 2, we are told, those who will share the benefits of the Savior's mediation will permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness. Our duty is to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain seeking, should be devoted to earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God and all need a knowledge for themselves for the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designed them to fill, designed them to fill. 
And so the Christian life is not a modification or a improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit has been given unto us so that we may be able to perfect our Christian character to holiness. Even in this life, it is not for our good to depart from the will of our Father in heaven. When we learn the power of his word, we shall not follow the suggestions of Satan in order to obtain food or to save our lives. Our only question will be, what is God's command and what his promise and what his promise? Knowing this, we shall obey the one and trust the other. Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. Remember in Psalms 1, uh, Psalms 119 verse 11, thy word have I kept in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And so uh, a general movement is needed and this must begin with individual movements in every church, let every member of every family make determined effort to deny self and to help forward the work. Let the children act apart. Let all cooperate. Let us do our best at this time to render to God our offering, to carry out his specified will and thus make an occasion for witnessing for him and his truth in a world of darkness. The lamb is in our hands. Let it is light shine. What can we say in this hour that we are living in, the Lord will have a people on the earth who will follow the Lamb whatsoever He goes. They will afflict their souls as it were in the day of atonement and seek the face of the Lord anew. They will trim their lamb as it is in Matthew chapter 25 and know about the requirements of the Lord at this time and not only for themselves but also for others who are thirsting for righteousness. And in these last three slides, uh, this is what we are encouraged. I'll just read my last three slides. There's a lot of information, but uh, I'd like just to stop here. We are told many have the idea that if their life is a working business life, they can do nothing for themselves, for, for the salvation of souls, nothing to advance the cause of their redeemer. They say they cannot do things by the halves and therefore turn from religious duties and religious exercises and bury themselves up in the world. They make their business primary and forget God and he's displeased with them. If any are engaged in business where they cannot advance in the divine life and perfect holiness in the fear of God, they should change to a business in which they can have Jesus with them every hour. Christian service page 108, paragraph 3. And so in this solemn day of atonement, in the cleansing of the sanctuary where people had to afflict themselves, if we are engaged in anything that doesn't give us an opportunity to be with Christ every hour, we are told that we should change that thing. Again, this Lifetime is too short to be squandered in vain trifling diversion, in unprofitable visiting, in needless dressing for display or in exciting amusements. We cannot afford to squander the time given us of God in which to bless others and in which to lay up for ourselves a treasure in heaven. We have none too much time for the discharge of necessary duties. We should give time to the culture of our own hearts and minds in order that we may be qualified for our life work. By neglecting these essential duties and conforming to the habits and customs of fashionable worldly society, we do ourselves and our children a great wrong. So if uh, our minds are not directed to overcoming sin daily and making others overcome that, we are doing them wrong. And also if we are not doing this for our children, we are doing our children a great, a great wrong. And lastly, here is the work going on, measuring the temple and it is worshippers to see who will stand in the last day. Those who stand fast shall have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
When we are doing our work, remember there is one that is watching the spirit in which we are doing it. Shall we not bring the Savior into our everyday lives, into our secular work and domestic duties? Then in the name of God, we want to leave behind everything that is not necessary, all gossiping or unprofitable visiting and present ourselves as servants of the living God. And in, uh, uh, in the book uh, of Chronicles, uh, in the book of Chronicles, we are told um, of the children of Issachar, men who had an understanding of time and what ought to be done. We should be like such a man who knows the time and what ought to be done. Otherwise, we will not know what we are supposed to do. We will not occupy our position and we will fail to exercise our faith. My admonition to you and to myself is that um, as long as the Lord allows us to live at such a time as this, we should seek him day and night. For seek ye the Lord while he may be found, for there is a time he may be sought and will not be found. This is the time to seek the Lord as it were with lighted candles that we may know of his rising if we shall partake of uh, his righteousness. Otherwise, the Lord bless us. And um, may we not only think of our salvation, but the people who are looking unto us. We are Seventh-day Adventists, and our work is to finish up the work. What work of bringing the sin to an end? And by the grace of God, we have been appointed to show forth the whole earth, the glory of God. He wants to use us as a people to shine forth his glory upon the face of the earth. The question is, will I rise up and answer his prayers? Will you rise up and answer to his prayers? Otherwise, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you once again that uh, you enable us to look at these themes of the sanctuary and its cleansing. My prayer is that um, you may give us the strength to follow the Lamb whatsoever he goeth. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Where he is is where we want to be. For being there in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And that joy of having our sins forgiven is what we need at such a time as this. And so bless us and uh, be with us in every aspect of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.